Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, again, a, a special thank you to all of you. Um, this is the, f um, the second time that we've opened up the TAMIS meeting to beyond just members, and we really see the synergy. Folks have been asking, can I come again next year? And yes, we welcome all of you to come. Tell, tell your friends uh, that this is kind of a, a great place to get a synopsis of everything that's going on that's new and exciting in medicine, engineering, and science and technology. So please, um, we look forward to seeing you in 2021 and in San Antonio. But what, yes, yay! <laughs> Uh, one of the greatest prides of TAMIST is really to acknowledge our, our early career investigators. And we're very honored that the um, Edith and Peter O'Donnell uh, Foundation uh, endowed us with uh, resources to be able to provide this award at TAMIST each and every year. So thank you all for, for being here. We would like to thank our conference sponsors, again, with a very special acknowledgement to our platinum sponsor, the Briar Capital, for, for their support of tonight's event. But we'd also like to thank our diamond sponsors, the Lytle Hill Philanthropies, Texas A&M University, Texas Instruments, and a joint sponsorship from UT Southwestern uh, Medical Center and the Southwest uh, Western Medical Foundation, and to all our other support and sponsors at all the different levels. Without you, we could not be here uh, this evening. So again, thank you so much. <laughs> Tamas would also like to thank the donors of the Tamist Endowment and the O'Donnell Endowment who are in attendance with us tonight. I'd like to special thanks to Jeff Kodowski with the Kodowski Foundation. Jeff, if you'll please stand. And Kern Windelthal, are you here? Can you please stand as well? Kern, are you here? No? OK. Uh, we'd also like to recognize the Tiffany Hartgraves Armstrong and the Serena Rich from the O'Donnell Foundation who are here with us uh, this evening. So can you please stand as well? Thank you for joining us tonight. And a very, very special thank you to Larry Faulkner and Kenny Jastrow for their establishing the Tamist Endowment. So uh, Larry, I know you're here, here this evening. Can you please stand? And you were with us last night as well. So thank you. These uh, are the forefathers of TAMIS, so we, uh, we're extremely thankful for, for all that you have done for us. We'd also like to thank the National Academy of Engineering President, John Anderson, for participating in this year's conference. And John, what a pleasure to, to have gotten to, to get to know you. Where, John, will you please stand as well? And, um, Uh, he, he has stayed here throughout the conference, so thank you very much. We're going to make you a Texan, so you'll have to come back to Texas. <laughs> you, yeah, you can leave Washington anytime now. Um, we'd also like to thank and welcome our past uh, TAMIS presidents and chancellors and presidents and members of our institutions uh, as well. So as I call your name, I'd, I'd like you to please stand and remain standing until I call all the names. So um, our past pre presidents in attendance, a very special friend, Ken Arnold with K. Arnold Consulting. The, the Honorable Gordon England with Dinotech. Where are you, Gordon? Thank you, thank you. Um, the, these individuals have done so much for Tamas. Don Paul with the University of Texas at Austin. David Russell with UT Southwestern Medical Center. David, are you here tonight? Also presidents in attendance, uh, Richard Benson with the University of Texas at Dallas. And my very own favorite president, Dr. William Henrich. So. <laughs> And 
and uh, Lawrence uh, Skovanovich uh, Nitsch uh, from Texas Tech University. Sorry if I've mispronounced your name. Thank you. We also have some uh, past uh, O'Donnell awardees. There are several of them. There's actually 10. And I'd like for all of you to stand up and be recognized as well. These are formal O'Donnell awardees. So please stand and be recognized. And before we begin the ceremony, we've had a, a slight change in the program uh, that I'd like to announce. Dr. Helen Hobbs is unable to join us tonight as the MC but we found a, just a phenomenal replacement for her. And I'd like to introduce our Masters of Ceremonies for this evening, Dr. Huda Zogby. Dr. Zogby is the Ralph D. Feigen uh, Professor of Pediatrics, Neurology, Neuroscience, and Molecular and Human Genetics at Baylor College of Medicine. She's also the investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and the founding director of the Jan D and Dan Duncan Neurological Research Institute of Texas Children's Hospital. She is also the winner of the Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences and a member of the National Academy of Medicine and the National Academy of Science. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Zogby. Please, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emily, for the very kind introduction. And I'm uh, sorry that Helen couldn't be here, but um, I felt like stepping in because as Helen says in her talks, at least in Texas or when she visits Baylor, we're the brunette and blonde sisters. So you've got the brunette version tonight. Um, so this is really exciting. I mean, it was no brainer for me to join and be the MC because to me this is the most exciting evening of the Tamist meeting when we celebrate the next generation of rising stars. And the Edith and Peter O'Donnell Awards annually recognize such rising stars and this has been phenomenal because typically the work uh, is not only creative and uh, uh, outstanding but it has lasting impact. This is, these awards represent a way to recognize young people at a critical time in their career and to raise the profile and awareness of these people. So since its inception, there have been 11 O'Donnell Awardee recipients that have been inducted to the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. So this really speaks to the fact that the selection committee is doing a great job picking fantastic people and increasing awareness about these people is landing them membership and recognition that they really deserve. The award is named in honor of Edith and Peter O'Donnell, who are among Texas' most devoted advocates for excellence in scientific achievement and STEM education. And they showcase, as I mentioned, the best and brightest in Texas, whose work will have lasting impact on society and lives. These awards, are special and they're competitive. The selection committee are members of the National Academies and after they come up with the list, Nobel laureates have to review the selection and approve the final group. So it's truly competitive and we congratulate all the winners tonight for an amazing uh, productive work. So today you're gonna hear from each of these recipients uh, I will introduce each recipient and then we will play a video highlighting their work to be followed by remarks by their nominator and then the recipient will have a chance to say a few words. So with that, I would like to begin and our first winner tonight is Susan Bess Frost who is the recipient of the 2020 Edith and Peter O'Donnell Award in Medicine. Dr. Frost is an assistant professor at the Sam and Ann Barship Institute for Longevity and Aging Studies at UT Health San Antonio. It's also nice to note that Dr. Frost is the first O'Donnell Award recipient from UT Health San Antonio. So let's learn a little bit more about Bess from the video. It's very important in beekeeping to really enjoy the process. You know, every day isn't honey extraction day. 
You know, you don't make a big discovery every day. You don't cure a disease every day. Of all the scourges we have today in 2019, 2020, Alzheimer's disease and neurodementia is close to the top of everybody's list. One in 10 individuals over the age of 65 have Alzheimer's disease, and that jumps to one in three over the age of 85. So in Alzheimer's disease, there are these two proteins. One of them is called amyloid beta, and one of them is called tau. We really wanna know what pathological forms of tau are doing in the brain. Why are they causing brain cells to die? Why are they causing inflammation? Right now, when someone's diagnosed, they already have so much tau in the brain. We think that trying to clear out that bad tau, it might be too late for those people. And so what we try to do is find how this disease happens and come up with new ways to target the disease progression and stop it. And then there are also areas of the genome where one piece of DNA can jump to another place in the genome. These are colloquially known as jumping genes. Bess Frost is an exceptional leader. She is highly focused, highly motivated to do this work. Really the goal in terms of drug development would be not to extend someone's lifespan, but really improve the quality of their life. I can tell you it's very hard to watch someone you love struggle with the disease. It's really important that we find a drug that can mitigate this disease. Seeing this jumping gene activation happening at such an early stage of a disease, when there is no cognitive impairment, means that we could intervene at this early stage of the disease and prevent memory loss. What she's accomplished thus far has enlightened the whole field and uh, will continue to do so. Now I would like to invite Bill Hendrich to say a few words about this. Well, thank you, Dr. Zogby, and good evening, everybody. It's my distinct honor to introduce a talented rising star in our state and in our country, Dr. Bess Frost. She received her undergraduate degree in cell and molecular biology from the University of Texas at Austin in 2004, a PhD from the University of California at San Francisco in 2009, then completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School in 2015. UT Health San Antonio was fortunate to recruit Dr. Frost as an assistant professor in the Barshop Institute. She has thrived at our institution as evidenced by the fact that she now holds, count them, 10 competitive grants, five from the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Frost works on understanding, as she said in the video, the root cause of Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases. Her focus has been on the toxic form of tau protein, prime factor in cognitive decline. Her graduate work catalyzed a new direction in neurodegenerative research as she found that some forms of tau protein can spread, causing more damage to neurons, thereby making the disease progress. So these are the facts about Bess, and they apply to her scientific career, but they don't tell the complete story. Like many leaders in science, she thinks vertically into problem solving. She's always attacking questions at their source. She isn't satisfied with dogma. She has the gift of making very complex scientific concepts accessible to learners and to lay listeners. Her interactions with patients and with families with neurodementia have motivated her to seek targets for therapy so that finally, finally, at long last, there will be progress in fighting these horrible diseases. And this last point is worth emphasis. Bess's charisma and her connection with people, with donors, with patients, with faculty, with graduate students, emanates from her sincerity of purpose. 
her native curiosity. And it's anchored by her beautiful family. She is a beautiful daughter, a wife to Eric, a mother of two wonderful children here tonight, Charlotte and David. David is currently asleep, missing this entire <laughs> event. Um, she is a positive role model for everyone with whom she comes in contact, and therefore she is an ideal recipient of the prestigious O'Donnell Award. And like all of Bess's colleagues, I count myself fortunate indeed that our paths have crossed, and I'm delighted to introduce her to you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bess Frost. Thank you so much, Dr. Henrich. That was a really very touching introduction. Um, I would really first like to thank uh, the O'Donnell Foundation and TAMIS Selection Committee for choosing me for this award. I was actually in the audience last year, and I remember being so blown away by the things that the recipients had accomplished, and I didn't think for a second that I would be up here the next year. It's such an honor. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Henrich for um, nominating me, along with my, um, the, my institutional and departmental chairs. Um, so Dr. Nick Moosey, the director of the Bar Shop, Dr. Suda Sashadri, who's here in the audience today, who's the director of the, our new Biggs Alzheimer's um, Institute for Neurodegener Neurodegenerative Research, um, as well as Chris Walter, who's the director of Cell Systems and Anatomy, my academic department. Um, what really attracted me to UT Health and what um, these wonderful bosses really do there is create a community in which there's a lot of interaction between basic scientists like myself and the clinicians. And I think that these type of interactions are really critical for translating what we're doing in the lab to actual um, you know, effects for patients. So I really, really thank you for creating that type of environment. And I love working at UT Health. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank uh, my previous mentors. So Mark Diamond was my PhD mentor. He's currently the director of the Alzheimer's Institute at UT, UT Southwestern. I was with him at UCSF. And I really learned from him that even if people don't believe or don't like your out-of-the-box thinking. It doesn't mean that your ideas are wrong and that you should still do what you need to do to test your hypotheses and believe in yourself and believe in your knowledge and take risks. And whatever you're working on, you need to really believe in it and really love it in order to make an impact. I'd like to thank my postdoc mentor, Mel Feeney, um, who's at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. She taught me that um, she really taught me how to communicate my science, both in writing and orally, and that no matter how great your data is, if you can't tell people about it and get other people excited about it, then it really stops with you, and the field doesn't move forward with what you found. I'd like to thank my lab, the people who are actually doing all of the work that I'm getting the credit for now. I never knew when I started this job how much I would care, how, how personally invested I would be in the happiness and success of my trainees. They work so hard. I feel so inspired by them. It's so rewarding to work with them. Um, I would like to also thank my family. So my dad, Ken Frost, after he retired, he became a full-time hiker, uh, pretty much. So he finished the Appalachian Trail, and he just did the Camino de Santiago, and it seems like he may just do all the trails. So I really, um, I think I, I got his uh, genes for adventure and risk taking. He's really an inspiration to me in what he's done after he retired and shows me how important it is uh, that you know the work isn't the only thing. There's a lot more to life um, besides work. I'd like to thank my mother, Dr. Diane uh, Davis Frost. She's a, a strong, uh, confident, resilient person who's made me into this strong, not in this moment, but um, <laughs> in general. I'm not actually a crier. Um, she's made, here we go. She's made me into the strong, resilient, confident person I am today. And she always told me as a child, and she reminds me even now when I'm complaining about things, that nothing really, really 
um, importance was easy. And I think that's a really great life lesson. I'd like to thank my kids, uh, Charlotte and Davis. You bring me such joy. You make my life full and happy. I cannot wait to see what you do in the world. Um, Davis wants to work at Torchy's Tacos, and uh, he's told me that he's going to give me free tacos, so I'm really looking forward to that in particular. Uh, my husband, Eric, um, he's been a constant source of support, like unlimited support through all of the moves and all of the hours and all of the travel. Um, I feel so lucky to have married someone who's not a scientist but who loves science so much. I'll get home from work after a long day and he'll want to go over the, um, he'll want to like rehash the intricacies of CRISPR when uh, all I want to do is watch Game of Thrones. Um, <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. I don't think I'm ever going to outgrow the feeling of, of really wanting to make all of you proud. So it's a great motivator for me and thank you. Thank you, Bess. Our next ORD is Jeffrey Reimer. He is the recipient of the 2020 Edith and Peter O'Donnell Award in Engineering. Dr. Reimer is the Abraham E. Duckler Professor of Chemical Engineering at the University of Houston. We'll now watch his video to learn more about his work. Photography has always been a lifelong hobby for me. And we look at things that from the naked eye appear to be very simple crystals. But when we look at these at molecular level, we bring out the inner beauty and also the complexity that we try to understand and approach. Just like a photographer, through unique angles, we can actually make a difference in developing an understanding of materials. Engineers have an eye on not just curiosity about what you can see and observe, but how can you use it? to make people's lives better. We're always looking for complex problems where there's lack of theory or lack of understanding. A major element here is this visualization, this ability to see what we couldn't see before. What you find is when you start using tools to look at the surfaces of crystals at near molecular level, the beauty really pops out. You can design molecules that will come and bind to these crystals and influence these processes. For example, in kidney stones, in the last 30 years, there have been no new developments of therapeutics. And so this is where engineering can have a big impact, how we address these critical problems. Also, you have areas like malaria where we know how current drugs work, but from a fundamental standpoint, we don't know their mechanisms of action. These are challenging areas where we've made great strides in how to design new materials, in the area of biomedicine, we've been able to think of new ways of designing drugs that can target crystals. And in doing so, we're treating some of the world's deadliest maladies. On the other hand, with catalysis, we're really approaching complex, non-classical pathways of crystallization. In the petrochemical industry, zeolite is a crystal. And so Jeff was able to focus on the fundamental study of crystal growth and then span out to malaria and kidney stone. By understanding this, we're making a huge step forward in fundamental science. I think every scientist wants to leave some kind of lasting legacy. And for me, particularly, I've really been inspired by fundamental aspects of research, looking at mechanisms of how crystals grow. Economides, I would like to invite you to introduce Jeff. Thanks very much. We're doing a little gender reversal here. I'm the nominator. He's the winner. <laughs> <clears throat> I am absolutely thrilled to introduce Dr. Jeffrey Reimer, recipient of the 2020 O'Donnell Award in Engineering. Dr. Reimer is an internationally recognized expert in crystal engineering. In 2018, he received the prestigious Norman Hackerman Award in Chemical Research by the Welch Foundation. First and foremost, Dr. Reimer is my colleague at the University of Houston in the Cullen College of Engineering. Part of Dr. Reimer's research relates directly to my own petroleum engineering interests. 
His contributions to the fields of zeolite and metal oxide nucleation and growth had led to a synthetic foundation for the design of high performance catalysts. From this work came a breakthrough discovery for the oxidative coupling of methane to ethylene. Ethylene is a critical feedstock for petrochemical based materials production. Petroleum engineering successes that we heard about this morning regarding hydraulic fracturing have led to an abundance of inexpensive methane that has spawned massive research interests in new methane based products. Odds are that right now, as I speak, everyone in this room is touching or consuming a petroleum based product. Now let's shift our focus to how Dr. Reimer has applied crystal engineering to biomedical research. Dr. Reimer has designed new drugs that prevent growth of two common types of kidney stones. The new drugs represent the first breakthrough in this area in the last 30 years. The work has spurred patents and startup companies and execution of clinical trials. Medicine often finds treatments for serious ailments without really understanding why they work. The anti-malarial drug artemisinin is a case in point. Jeff's crystal visualization <coughs> allowed the first ever look at artemisinin in action. With this new capability, Jeff observed that the drug slows growth of hematid crystals and thereby allows free hemoproteins to kill the malaria pa parasites in the blood. Dr. Reimer is an endowed professor in the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering. Over the past 10 years, he has employed more than 33 postdoctoral doctoral, uh, fellows and PhD students. His lab has kept a focus on synthesis and visualization of non crest classical crystallization. And I think we have every reason to expect more important breakthroughs in the future. And I would just also like to remind Jeffrey that zeolite's pretty nice, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I really want to let uh, hit, uh, Jeffrey take over. <laughs> Wow. Well, I'd just like to start off by thanking TAMIST, um, particularly the awards committee, as well as the O'Donnell family and the O'Donnell Foundation for this. This is uh, an extreme honor. And I'd also like to congratulate the other awardees here. It's, it's an honor to share the podium with them uh, today. Uh, for the nomination process, I was very fortunate to have three letter writers that have been very influential for me. But most importantly, the, the nominator, Christine. Um, Christine has been a really strong and passionate advocate at the University of Houston for really promoting uh, young faculty and, and making sure that their work is, is known and has been a really good mentor and very proud to call her a colleague in the College of Engineering. So thank you so much, Christine, for this. Um, I'm a strong believer in the adage that people are a product of their environments. And I have to say, over the years, from grade school until my current position right now, I have been surrounded by some pretty... Um, amazing environments, people, friends, family, colleagues, mentors that have helped me along the way. Uh, starting with my family, my parents have been there every step of the way of, and have been every bit amazing as, as they could be. Um, my wife and kids who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight have also been amazing. Uh, as, as faculty, we don't make it easy on our family. Right? We work hard hours, we travel a lot. And so to have the love and support of, of your family behind that makes a human, uh, huge difference. And uh, my wife, Allie, has just been amazing um, throughout this whole process. She really is. So I, I owe her everything. 
Um, I've had a lot of uh, fantastic mentors over the years, um, people that have really taught me rigorous ways and critical thinking of doing research. And I've taken that really to the University of Houston, which itself has been an absolutely amazing atmosphere to do research. Really the support at the University of Houston at all levels has been amazing, all the way from upper administration to the college, uh, Dean Joe Tedesco, who has been a big advocate. And at the college level, or at the department level, um, I've, I've been beneficial to have two really good chairs, Ramanan Krishnamurti, who hired me, and it was really supportive early on, and Mike Harold, who's the current chair right now, who is always looking for ways to promote my work and, and has been fabulous. As well as the colleagues, there's a number here tonight, but um, it's just a very collegial atmosphere there. And uh, it's, it's very special when you can say that you really do enjoy going to work each and every day, and I do. It's also made it fun for the research that we do, as, as we saw in the video. We really can bridge both fundamental and applied work that we do. And this really allows us, in many ways, to be in a very nice position of making some type of an impact in society, whether it's designing a catalyst for industry or a drug that could impact individuals' lives. And in that respect, it can be a very humbling experience. And a lot of these involve very challenging problems. And um, really the approach that my group has had to this is to tackle these head on. I think my favorite poet Robert Frost summed this up in a quote saying, the best way out is always through. Meaning in these challenging situations, you always tackle things directly. And in, in doing this, we've looked at some very difficult problems. and, and you can't do this unless you have a strong team. And I have been extremely fortunate over the last 10 years at Houston to have amazing students, hardworking and motivated students, but also talented and very creative. And this creativity has really been the difference in the discoveries that we've made, as well as collaborators. We're a highly collaborative group of over 40 people that we've worked with. And um, this has really allowed us not only to expand the breadth of our work, but the depth the ability to look at these problems in great detail. And so this award really is not so much an individualistic award as it is a team effort. And I've, I've been just extremely fortunate with the people that I've been working with over the last 10 years. And in concluding, I'd just like to once again thank TAMIST um, and, and the members of TAMIST in particular, which makes this an extremely special award because I think I probably speak for a lot of the young researchers here, protégés and award winners, and saying that we have a, a tremendous amount of respect for people in the National Academy. You inspire us, and we hope that in many respects, the work that we can do over our careers can have an impact in a way that we could join your ranks someday. And so thank you for this. It's, it's extremely special coming from this organization to receive this award. Extremely humbling and um, honored, and, and once again, thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff. Our next awardee is Alessandra Corsi. She is the recipient of the 2020 Edith and Peter O'Donnell Award in Science. Dr. Corsi is an associate professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Texas Tech University. She is the first O'Donnell Award recipient from Texas Tech. Now let's learn more about her from the video. For me, playing the piano is that uh, bit of time that I live for myself and where my mind is free to focus on new ideas. The sound I'm playing is in a frequency range, which is comparable to the frequencies at which uh, gravitational waves from two smashing neutron stars actually carry their signal in the LIGO detectors. We've scored our very first detection of gravitational waves and light from one single system, a pair of neutron stars. Under the effect of gravity, they started uh, spiraling along each other. Uh, so they continued in this dance until they collided and merged and uh, created a bunch of neutron-rich debris around them and then unleashed fast jets that started racing through the interstellar medium at speed close to the speed of light. Dr. Corsi was one of the people who found the gamma ray burst that was associated with this merger. And this was the first time that any group of astronomers had found gravitational waves 
and a typical light source from the same event. I like to think about it as a, a multi-sensory exploration of our universe, uh, where gravitational waves tells you part of the story and then light completes that story. It's uh, looking forward to all this that we can really understand how heavy elements are formed in the universe, how our universe is expanding, what sorts of astrophysics is behind those fastest jets we know of in the universe. I am lucky to be able to work with a very large array. This is one of the most sensitive array of radio telescope we have in the world. Being involved with research that's cutting edge, that's on the tip of science, where people are saying that, you know, she's one of the best up and coming astrophysicists in the world, is just so inspiring. She has accomplished tremendous amounts, very well known in our field may indeed be the pioneering leading researcher in the world. She realizes that it's not just about her research, it's about how she broadens that and how she extends it to other people and gets them involved. Every day I get to learn one new idea and I love the fact that this is my job. You don't have to be discouraged if not everything goes as you would have hoped and sometimes you know the surprises are even better than what you had wished. to invite Fazli Hussein to tell us more about Alessandra. This is indeed a great and a thrilling moment in my life. I was one of the founding members of TEMIST, and every year since then, I have nominated people when I was at University of Houston and for the last seven years at Texas Tech, and I'm really thrilled to admit that this is the first time we became successful. <clears throat> I'm indeed extremely honored to introduce our science winner. Alessandra Corsi is an associate professor in physics and astronomy at Texas Tech University. She received her Laurea in physics in 2003 and her PhD in astronomy in 2007 from the University of Rome, Italy. She did postdoc research at Penn State and Caltech before she joined Texas Tech faculty in 2014. In 2015, Corsi received an NSF Career Award. She became an awardee of Italy's National L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science Award, a fellow of the Research Corporation of, for Science uh, Advancement, and also a fellow of the American Physical Society at rather early age. As a member of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, she is a recipient of the Gruber Cosmology Prize, the uh, Special Breakthrough Prize in uh, Fundamental Physics, the Bruno Rossi Prize, and the Royal Astronomical Society Group Achievement Award. <clears throat> Dr. Corsi's research on massive stars, neutron stars, and black holes in the context of multi-messenger, namely multi-signal, uh, time domain astronomy. This is, I guess, a new field in astronomy. She has worked for the past decade bridging gravitational physics and radio astronomy, beginning with her work on gravitational waves before they were detected. Her studies recently culminated in the discovery 
of the first binary neutron star merger detected in both gravitational waves and light. <clears throat> Multi-messenger astronomy uh, opens a new window on the universe where collisions of neutron stars and black holes are explored by combining two different signals, electromagnetic signals, namely light and the gravitational waves. Her original contributions have established Alessandro Corsi as one of the youngest international leaders in the newly born field of multi-messenger astronomy as, and also as one of the leading rising bright stars at Texas Tech University. Please welcome Dr. Alessandra Corsi. Thank you very much uh, to Thomas and to the O'Donnell Family and Foundation for this wonderful recognition. I want to say, first of all, I am extremely happy. Uh, this goes uh, sincerely beyond my, my dreams. So thank you very much for this recognition. I also wanted to thank uh, all of the colleagues who helped me arrive to this point. I had, uh, since I moved to the United States, several mentors that as I like to say, I have independently adopted, and so they were really crucial for my path uh, in, uh, in uh, the new world of science here in this country, and I'm very grateful to them. I'd also like to thank the many colleagues of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration, because uh, without them, I couldn't be part of this uh, wonderful discovery, and then the National Science Foundation, who funds my research. Uh, a very special thank you goes to um, my nominator, Fasil Hussein. Thank you very much for uh, you know, doing all this for me. And most of all, to my institution, Texas Tech University. Uh, Texas Tech invested in my field of research uh, when multi-messenger astronomy hadn't boomed yet, and it wasn't clear at all that it would have. So I think this uh, speaks to their strategic vision and one model we have at Texas Tech is from here it's possible. And I like the fact that I feel uh, that spirit every day I go to work. So I am extremely proud uh, of being at Tech. I'd also like to thank the students and postdocs uh, who work with me because they motivate me every day. Uh, I hope to be as useful to them as my mentors have been to me. And uh, then I'd also, of course, uh, like uh, to thank my family, uh, both the Italian side of the family and the US side of the family. <laughs> Without my mom, dad, and sister, I wouldn't be a scientist today. And by the way, happy birthday, dad, is my dad's uh, 71st birthday today. And um, <laughs> thank you. And then the US side of the family really welcomed me in this country and gave me that uh, warm feeling that enabled me to have not just a career here, but my own family. So uh, particularly tonight, I'd like to thank uh, Sally and Dave for being here for me. And then uh, even if he cannot hear me because he could not be here, my husband Ben was looking after our four months old baby at home. So thank you very much to Ben for giving me, making me be here tonight. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Alessandra. Beautiful. Our last award tonight goes to Christine Kiswetter and Deepak Kilpadi 
They're the recipients of the 2020 Edith and Peter O'Donnell Award in Technology Innovation. Dr. Kiswater is the Senior Director in the Device Sciences Center of Excellence at KCI, an Acility company, and Dr. Kilpadi is the Medical Science Liaison at Acility. Let's learn more about their work from the video. My husband and I own a construction cleanup company and I was out working when I approached the truck and unfortunately the stabilizing leg came down on my foot, breaking my toes, crushing the ball of my foot. A month after my first surgery, I thought I was healing, but I went into the wound clinic for my appointment and that's when I realized something was seriously wrong. When he saw my wound, he looked at it, could tell it was dehissed and told me that I had to go in for surgery that day. No one wants to be on our products. Nobody wants anybody we love to be on our products. But should that need arise, you know, should, should somebody be in an accident or should your grandma discover that she's got an ulcer, you want our products to be there. So the way that negative pressure wound therapy works or back therapy works is there's a manifold material. It's a polyurethane. We use a reticulated polyurethane foam. So what the foam allowed was this manifolding, this, this passage of fluids along the struts of the foam, and it could be sucked out. We got better repair tissue that filled that space. I think the passion that Chris and Deepak have is really driven by seeing the effects on patients' lives. I woke up from surgery with back therapy on my foot. I love to be outside hiking and going for walks and spending time with my family and friends. I'm so grateful that I am able to do those things again. What we're able to do is take somebody who's had a wound for maybe 10 years, walking around with a wound that just simply does not heal, and actually close that wound. I can tell you that the first few times that a surgeon would take off that dressing, they couldn't help themselves from saying, wow. The work that both Deepak and Chris have done is to help bridge that knowledge gap. Their ability to take something that is so complex and be able to package it up to deliver it is powerful. This is not just wound care. It affects your way of life. It affects people's livelihoods. It affects a person's sense of self-esteem. You know, 10 million wounds over the course of 15 years is pretty impressive. It makes an impact on why I get out of bed and why I do what I do. John Harper will do the introduction. Thank you. Well, it's a great honor to be able to introduce you to two very good friends and colleagues that I've known for over a decade. Um, as you learned this afternoon, wounds can be a terrible thing, highly morbid. Uh, the mortality of, of serious wounds and amputations is staggering. The work that Deepak and Chris have done uh, on the mechanisms of how these things work, have really given clinicians the permission and the confidence to use the products. So when we introduced this technology 25 years ago, the, the, it, revo it was clear it was gonna revolutionize wound care just by the results that we were seeing. But still people are skeptical about new technology. And over the last almost two decades, these two have done some very, they're both very well-trained biomedical engineers, and they've studied these products in animals on the bench top and developed data. We've published a lot of data. They both have been very prolific uh, writers in the scientific literature. And it's from this information that doctors, surgeons, nurses uh, feel confident enough to put this on their patients. And I think most importantly, what we've learned in the past, I would say 20 years, 15 to 20, excuse me, 15 to 20 years, has not only helped the product get, getting on more patients, but it's also helped us innovate further. And I think understanding the, the biomechanical forces that, uh, that Chris and Deepak talked about this afternoon has allowed us to sort of understand how we can do this better. And we've now developed uh, new dressings that, that will revolutionize yet again uh, the, the wound care. Um, uh, practice. Chris is a very passionate leader. Her 
Uh, her lab, her folks in her lab, are she's very devoted to them. They're very loyal to her. She works for them. Uh, it's just really fun to watch her lead her folks um, in the lab. We've worked very closely together over the past 10 years. And um, she's still continuing her venture in studying the mechanism of action of our new dressings that we developed. Uh, Deepak has taken a bit of a turn uh, from the from the lab and looking at mechanisms, and he's taken his skill and knowledge and has taken it to the street, so to speak. As a medical science liaison, he and I work very closely together now, uh, going out and communicating these very complex uh, messages to nurses and to surgeons that, that, that help them understand how these products work. So he's now translating these very complex mechanism studies that, uh, that he and Chris have done over the past couple of decades and that's what he's doing full time. So um, I think playing to his strengths of communicating and understanding complex issues. So ladies and gentlemen, please help me uh, welcome and congratulate Dr. Chris Keeswetter and Dr. Deepak Kilpati. So I'd like to thank the Tamus Foundation and the O'Donnell, and I think the, the O'Donnell Foundation and the Tamus organization for acknowledging those of us who work in industry and do science in industry. We live by different metrics than you, than you folks in, in academics, and to actually be acknowledged in this august body is, is very humbling. Um, as I mentioned earlier, wound care is something that 20 years ago, when Denny Ware pulled me into his office and said, we've got this fact therapy thing, and it works, but I don't understand why. I need you to go out there and figure it out. Never in a zillion years did I think I would devote 20 years of my life and become so passionate about wounds and about getting people better. You know, in the course of the three minutes I have up here, six people in the world will have an amputation because of a wound. There's some really smart people in this room. We can do a lot about that. Um, I'd like to thank my family. I'd like to thank my mom and dad for you know, putting up with me being the scientific kid, just trying stuff, <laughs> you know, all the experiments that sometimes we you know, don't want to tell anybody about that you did. Um, <laughs> um, and I'd like to thank Amy Law and John and Ann Solomon for the, for the you know, for the honor of just putting me out there in terms of, again, being in front of this august body as an industrial scientist. Very, very humbling. And finally, I'd like to thank my husband. Uh, he does video production work, and he's really into horror movies and things like that. So some of the stuff that, you know, I get to see in his world <laughs> really weirds me out. But then when I come home and I show him what actual human beings are going through, and living through, and what the human body can, surpri can surprisingly live through, I totally weird him out. <laughs> you know, so the fact that he can see on TV this made up, what happens to people, and you know, internalize that and be okay with that, but to see what actually human beings are dealing with, and to really understand and tie to that, um, you know, I'm very appreciative, Jim, of your being able to to help me get up in the morning and deal with that kind of thing and to, to, to really look at really some pretty gross stuff that is out there. And, and you know, I'd like to close seriously by, by saying thank you very much and to encourage, there's some really smart people in this room. There's some huge problems. The state of Texas, you know, we're looking for the next best thing. I, the next big thing for us to do I really do think we should think about wounds and addressing this huge public health issue that we have. We've got really smart people. There's a lot of healing that happens in Texas already. We can make a concerted effort to make it a holistic thing so that people can be whole and their lives can be restored. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Tamist. Thank you, the O'Donnell Endowment. Thank you, the awards committees. Thank you, the org thank you to the organizers. And thank you for all of you. Thank you not just for bestowing upon us this entire esteemed panel, the, this, this, this thing of privilege, this thing of honor, but also for elevating, as Chris mentioned, the focus on wound care. We know that it is a significant issue. It, um, it, it destroys lives. I remember as a postdoc, I stepped, I, I, we had the privilege of, of shadowing some of our clinician collaborators. And it was about January, soon after the Christmas holidays, I see this patient who had had a foot ulcer. So I asked her how she was, and she tells me, they chopped off my foot. And she just burst into tears. Or the time when my wife and I were at a convention or at a meeting, and we were sitting next to this lovely young lady, and we got talking, we asked each other about what we were doing, and she said, and when I mentioned KCI, she said, oh, the wound pack people. You know, my husband had a kidney transplant, but his incision wasn't healing, and we thought we were gonna lose him. And they used this newfangled thing, and it saved him. So we drive back home, it's about 10 o'clock at night, the phone rings, it's her husband. I had nothing to do with that specific transaction of sorts, but that really does touch one's heart. That makes all the difference. That's why we wake up in the morning, we do the things we do. Now, while our therapies, our technologies have made such a big impact in the treatment of wounds, there's a lot more that needs to be done. And to echo Chris, there's a great need to better understand what to do with wounds, how to educate both clinicians and patients, and have outreach. And so I think with the powerful voices that you have, if you can elevate this uh, under-acknowledged epidemic that we have around the world, not just in the US, you know, we can possibly do greater things. And I have to thank Anne, Anne Solomon for, for helping focus this along with John Harper and Amy Law. They've been tremendous support. And Chris Keysweater, Chris and I have known each other since we were in graduate school, right? Society for Bi Biomaterials. We had common classmates from undergrad, right? And uh, yeah, and thank you for your support. We, we've worked together a long while. KCI has been tremendous. Not all companies allow us to publish the way we have, the, the, the kind of studies we've done, and the ability to interact with clinicians and researchers and be able to, to incorporate that as a continuum. I also want to thank Barbara Collins, who was in that video. And she was, she was a partner with me in a lot of our uh, preclinical studies. Uh, we managed the animal studies group, and she was tremendous. I mean, and so I, I want to thank her, and, 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 and of course, this is a team effort. So we need, you know, we, we needed, we need the folks both inside our organizations as well as outside. I want to thank my old mentors, Jack Lemons, who was my PhD advisor. He was in orthopedic biomaterials. That I'd, I'd first cut my teeth in biomedical applications of engineering, and then Dale Feldman, who really got me into wound healing. I also want to thank my family. I've got three generations represented right here. My parents, uh, who instilled in, in us, my siblings and me, curiosity and, 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 and just you know, the love for research. My wife, who stands by me as I travel all over the place, and, uh, and my little daughter, Karina, who keeps me, who, who helps kind of tell me what it's all about in the end, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah, but, but that's, what, that's what matters. It's, it, in the end, it's the family and how we kind of bring it all together, right? And as a society, keeps us centered, keeps us humble, and hopefully keeps us motivated and inspired. And with that, thank you again, most humbly, for this great accolade. Appreciate it.
Thank you, Deepak. So what a wonderful group of rising stars. Really special thanks to the nominators for bringing them to our attention. And thank you for being here to celebrate them with us. This has been really wonderful, and I hope this tradition will continue. And please note that in early February, the TAMIS website will have the information for the new nomination for the 2021 awards. So we need more stars like this to celebrate and feel hopeful about the future. I think, I hope you would agree with me why I said this is the most wonderful part of the meeting. And today, I hope you experience what I always feel about Texas creativity and generosity. I think there is no reason to, for me to repeat all the creative, wonderful uh, research that's happening here and the impact it has on society and lives. Generosity is absolutely a Texas feature. The generosity of the O'Donnells and the Tamis members make these awards possible every year. Thank you for helping us celebrate Texas Rising Stars in research and we hope that you will continue to help TAMIS continue this tradition by contributing tonight. I know the staff is ready to help you receive donation, and I believe there is a website. Uh, yes, they can, I think they're gonna project the website, right? So that you can reach there to help, because I think this is something really important. This is how we watch the next generation of scientists do their best work and celebrate them. So with this, I'd like to conclude tonight's celebration and tell you the conference program will start again tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. in this room. There'll be a breakfast buffet outside, and the session during the breakfast will be transformed to innovate, featuring speaker Mamie Jones from the Intuit Pro Connect, and the, bars, the bar will stay open till 10 p.m. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the evening, and we'll see you tomorrow.